Um, well, I will give you a proper introduction and post-production so that we can just kind of roll into a casual conversation. Okay. But let's start with how did you end up in Hawaii? Yeah, well, I, I actually, my parents moved me. <laughs> um, I, I was born in the South and my family's from the South in Tennessee, Mississippi and Kentucky. But they moved me to Seattle when I was eight. And then they moved from Seattle to the to the Big Island actually when I was fifteen. Okay. So I was I was taken <laughs> there, and then I came to Oahu to go to college, and then the waves were really good, so I stayed. <laughs> My whole family actually went back to the mainland. Oh, did they really? Yeah. Um. So, do you have memories from growing up in Tennessee? I mean, not that much. Okay. Not what brought the what uh what brought them to the Big Island? You know, they were I don't know. They just kind of checked out. You know. <laughs> what did they, what did what did they do for work? Well, my dad was a, a like a penny stock broker, and you know, in the eighties, that was like the time to be doing that. <laughs> you know, so he did really well, and then he just actually he moved his business to the big island because they had a fax machine so that that shows the time <laughs> when when i could move because you know before it's different time zone and everything yeah so they just wanted to kind of get out and so they came but yeah i mean back then there weren't that many howleys here and especially not on the big island the big island had like one stoplight in the whole town <laughs> you know it was a totally different life yeah. yeah. Which side of the island were you on? Kona side. Yeah. yeah. So I I learned to surf with like Shano and Kona, and those guys. Amazing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So. I I mean that. First of all, that time had to be so much different in Hawaii and certainly the Big Island. Um. But that is the fantasy. Like. Because even now, if you try to live that fantasy of selling it all, move to Hawaii, it's a different Hawaii. But back then, that was the fantasy. And so I admire your parents for actually taking the risk and doing it. Yeah, I mean, I guess it was the fantasy, but it was different, a lot different back then, too. It was um, more of a sacrifice, I'm going to say. Um, because like like I said, it wasn't like like now you have a lot of um, people from the mainland who just come and hang out with other people from the mainland but back then you know you came to Hawaii you became a part of the community here you know like um, yeah you, you, you sort of had to live by the ways that were here and uh, you had to learn and you know so yeah you know it's it was it was it was different you know um do you have any examples? Like what were the biggest biggest culture shocks for you coming from Seattle? Yeah, well, I was actually really into, uh, I was into hip hop. I, I was a gymnast and then I was like an Olympic level gymnast and then I got into hip hop. So that it was like taking me out of everything I loved. I hated it. I didn't want to move and, you know. So a couple of my friends were like, well, you live in Hawaii, you gotta, you gotta learn how to surf, so. So that's what I did. <laughs> and, you know, so now I'm actually writing a dissertation about like hip hop and Hetanalu. So Hetanalu being surfing as, you know, a way, a form of literature, like a new way of reading and writing. Like we read waves, you know, our writing, we, we when we surf, that's, that's a response to our reading of the waves, you know, and hip hop is the same, you know, if you see surfing as like a dance, you know, it's sort of this, um, you know, it's it's not like other sports. It's 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 spontaneous. You have to improvise. You know, it's it's applied knowledge. It's not like learned. You're not learning choreograph choreography. You're not practicing a routine. You're learning a knowledge that you have to apply at a given moment, depending on the variables of that moment. You know. Yeah. So so yeah, that's interesting. Uh, we're coming up on like the fiftieth anniversary of hip hop. So 
yeah. the 50 the 50th anniversary of hip hop yeah it's going to be next august wow so what uh how did we or how did they decide when the kind of birth of hip hop was yeah so you know there's a lot of different you know views on that but and and hip hop comes out of a lot of different other things but um basically they're saying like cool herc's uh block party on Sedgwick's Avenue is sort of like what they decided. I mean, most people kind of agree on that. There's a lot of discrepancy between whether it was really the South Bronx or like there's other there's other circles that started in Queens and stuff like that. And if if you really look into it, like disco and like house kind of started at that time too. So so yeah, but yeah, so I guess that's sort of the day they picked. It's um in surfing that happens too, where, you know, um, it, with the shortboard revolution, it's like everybody kind of came to the conclusion simultaneously. So it's hard to exactly identify that it was in Australia or in California or in Hawaii, because so much had happened that just led to that as a natural conclusion. Right. So it's probably yeah. somewhat similar. Yeah. Um, how did you discover hip hop? And was that when you were in Seattle? Yeah, yeah. So I was in, that was, you know, during the time when it was coming, uh, coming, merging, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, I, I just, you know, it was the day Michael Jackson moonwalked across the stage. Really? I think I was already kind of experimenting, but at that moment, I was like, that's, that's it. I was, I was like a Michael Jackson maniac. I had like his posters all over my room, all over the ceilings. I had everything. You can find Michael Jackson. So when he did that, I was like, I got to learn this dance, you know. I was learning all his dance, and then I, I became a B-girl. So I was actually one of the, the first women to, or one of the few women, I guess I should say, to, to like, actually, like, dance in the streets and the circles and stuff like that back in those days. Was that in Seattle? That was in Seattle, yeah. Was there much of a hip hop scene in Seattle? There, there was. We had a, a pretty, a pretty flourishing little scene there. Um, we totally followed New York. Um, the guy, my my crew leader, is named D Rock. Um, now he's known as DJ Mister Su- Supreme. He's pretty famous. He he really had a lot to do like with starting hip hop back in that time in Seattle. And a couple, another guy, Fever One, who became like a really famous b-boy from Seattle. He he came out of our crew too. And my my picture and some of my my old pumas are actually in the uh, Smithsonian, the Natural Museum of American History. Yeah, in Washington, D.C.? Uh, no, I think it's the one in New York. I don't know. Okay. It's online, though. It's like their online collection. But yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So yeah, when I came to, you know, when I came to to a walk, it was like, I mean, big island, you know, it's like lava. Like I landed in, I was like from the sea, I was like into going to clubs and dancing and going downtown and dancing in the streets. And that was everything. And then, and also I was a gymnast. And so I came to the big island land in this field of lava, like, there's nothing in there, you know, there's one stoplight. <laughs> it, yeah. was, it was insane. And then I was like, well, that's over. And then I went to like a gym to practice and I did a handstand on the bars and hit the ceiling. So they, they so they didn't really have a gym. So I sort of had to give up everything I knew, you know. And then one of one of my friends I went to school with was like, she was like from New York because we went to HBA, so the Howley Protection Agency. But it was like the boarding school. And um she um she was from New York and she's like, you gotta learn to surf. And she surfed. So, you know, I kind of and then my my crew leader was like, you gotta surf, you know. And he was all into surfwear, like all the hip hop scene was into like TNC shirts and stuff like that at that time, and like the gotcha shorts and everything. So I would send him back like like t-shirts from TNC. And I'm like, that was like hip in the scene back that in that time, you know. And then he would send me like hip hop mixtapes and stuff like that. So that's fascinating. Yeah. So it kind of prepared me for surfing. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, that's such an interesting intersection or the way that you described it relating to one another makes mm -hmm. perfect sense. I've just never thought of it before, you know? Right, right. Um, and like I was saying, for your parents, it there was the dream to move to Hawaii, but now that you explain your background, it sounds like it was probably a nightmare for you to give all of that up. And yeah. I mean, information wasn't as accessible either. So you probably, they probably didn't play hip hop on the radio stations even in Hawaii, right? No, no. I remember I was playing like, you know, once I started surfing, I got to, you know, I got to know some of the, the boys and stuff. And I, I was in my car and I was playing some Run DMC and they were like, just laughing. Like they'd never heard it before. They're like, what is this? <laughs> you know? I was like, God, what's wrong with you people? You know, <laughs> no, know who Randy and C is, right? You know, um, or maybe they just thought it was funny that I was holy and I was listening to that. That could have been it too, you know. Maybe because back then um, it wasn't it wasn't so um, like everybody was into hip hop, especially not holy. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. So, yeah. Um, so you mentioned Shane and Conan, Conan Hayes. Who was? I mean, were they your same age group and who were kind of the, what was the scene like back then? Who were the guys? And then were there any female surfers in that group at all, other than yourself? What And what was your introduction to surfing as a whole? Yeah. So the Big Island was, is really different than my experience on Oahu in some ways, but some ways similar. Um, you know, there weren't, there was only one other girl surfing at that time that I knew of. There was a couple others, but there was only one that I saw. And I didn't see her at first. So it was kind of like, you know, we were, I was sitting on the beach with my girlfriend, you know, burning ourselves because I, I guess that's what we thought made us look pretty or something. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, you know, why are you, you know, those guys are out there surfing. I, I want to try that, you know, like, why are we sitting here on the beach? So I don't know. I guess I got this idea. I wanted to go surfing. And um, one of the guys, boyfriends took me out there and it was like a terrible experience like they didn't tell me anything to do I like had this long board and I knew nothing about surfing I was from Seattle like you know it's the Pacific Sound there's no waves I mean not where I was from um but yeah and so I'm out there I'm like what do I do and there's like waves <laughs> it was terrible so I got in though and then another friend took me out to a place called Pine Trees I was at Kahalu'u. Another friend took me to a place called Pine Trees and kind of like he had like a short board and I actually stood up on my first try. So I was I was like literally hooked that day. And then I had some other girlfriends try with me, but they were pretty much over it after that day, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was so different. Like so one of those girls I was with, we we were gonna try to go surf at that place, Kahalu, and then so we just paddled out and these people saw us going out. They're like, don't go out. There's it's bad right now. There's current. And we we're like, whatever. So we went out. We got we we're getting sucked out the sea. We had to come in through the lava rocks, you know. And then another time at Banyans, which, which is the main break there where I, you know, ended up surfing. You know, I went over there and I asked, there's a bunch of guys, all the boys were hanging out. And I was like, how do I get out here? You know, and I walked down and they looked at me. They're like, you walk down and you paddle straight out, you know? And I'm like, okay. So I walked down, I paddle straight out. And I'm next thing I know, I'm standing in a big pile of Vana on the reef. And then I, I look back, I mean, I listen and I look back a little, I see them all pointing and laughing at me. And then they're like, look, it's Jesus walking on the water. Like they <laughs> intentionally like told me the wrong place to paddle out, you know? Luckily I didn't get, you know, Vana in my my foot. I don't, and I don't know what happened after that. I just remember that. But you know, it was always like that. You know, like it was. You know, there weren't there weren't women. You know, and as as a howley too, it was like obviously I I didn't know what I was doing in that case. You know, <laughs> but it was just funny to people. Like it was fun. They wanted to make fun, and it was funny to them that I was trying, and you know, so. Oh gosh, I went through that. And then like Conan, he always hated me because he always said I was in the way. You know, I, I probably was. And I tried not to be. I didn't know what I was doing. I was like right. I had nobody to help me. My parents had 
probably didn't even know I was surfing. Um, nobody, you know, there was no guidance whatsoever. I was just going, you know, and um, I kind of eventually figured it out. But yeah, you know, on the big island, like, if you if you got in the way, you got, you know, you got in trouble. <laughs> No. Yeah. Well, there's, a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of consequence in those surf spots too. You know, there's not a lot of room for error. Right. Right. Yeah. It's all lava. You know, it's all leaf, like jazz yeah. with lots of vana all over the place. So why do you, um, what do you attribute your perseverance to? Like, why didn't you just give up if people are harassing you that much and there is that much consequence? You know, it's the same reason I persevere today with like half a shoulder, half a knee, half a hip, you know, no, it's like, I just, it's just that feeling of being out there and, and then like the bonus of being able to ride a wave, you know, it's just, I literally was hooked from that, that first day, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it is, it's, it's funny. Cause like being an old surfer is, it's got its own challenges, you know, <laughs> it's like a whole it's like you're starting over you know because you're doing it with so much less and you're gauging your um like God, I really want to be out there but I don't want to not be able to move my shoulders for three and a half months <laughs> you know so I've got to decide be more selective and it's just so crushing sometimes like oh, I want to be out there so bad you know so it's like you you learn this whole thing and then you go all the way up and then you go back down. But I think, you know, nowadays it's probably just as important to me as it ever was, you know? It's really? Like, yeah. It's like, it's the thing that keeps me like sane. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. yeah so. I know. It's the way you described that. I'm realizing there's a window, maybe from like the age of 18 to 25, maybe like a seven year window yeah. where you're hitting the zenith of. Yeah your body's performing at its best. You have enough experience under your belt to where you're, you know, you know how the ocean operates and all that sort of stuff. And then everything after 28, it's just a slow downward decline. <laughs> and, and then you have your mental, like trying to accept that right. decline, you know? Right. And I think I'm in my forties now and I'm like, I can accept, I will never, my best surfing is behind me. And now I've just <laughs> got to appreciate the fact that I'm getting in the water Right. Getting a couple waves, don't have right. to perform, yeah. you know. Yeah, I know it's 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 kind of a funny thing. I don't know though, you know, the, the cool thing about surfing though is it goes back to what I was saying before. It really is like a relationship with the waves too, though. So like if the surf is perfect and you know the spot and your experience and all of that, you can still like get the best wave because you know how to get in the spot, you know how to get the wave, you know. Yeah, so it does have that bonus, but then you have to know not to like just go out and think you're gonna, you know, be like those twenty-five-year-olds you're surfing, with, you know, or the thirteen-year-olds, yeah. or you know, and especially in certain kind of conditions. For me, it's just like if it's lumpy, if it's warbly, all of that, like it, it just doesn't matter. I try to be careful, you know. And yeah. I know older guys that are older than me, you know, they're like seven and they're still surfing. They'll be like, we'll still go out big. But if it's messy, I'm not going anywhere near it because that's how you just have no, you have no like cartilage left. You have no like, you know, there's no sponge. So it's just like everything. You have to do it all right now. You know, you have to be the yeah. your best surfer ever, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that is the benefit of uh, decades in the ocean is you have a lot more experience and you get worked less, you know, like I don't wipe yeah. out nearly as much. I don't have uh terrible, you know, put myself in the impact zone nearly as much as I used to when I was in my twenties. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you can mitigate some of those disasters. Yeah. Um, so what then brought you to Oahu from the big Island or how'd you get there? Yeah, so I just actually just came for college over here to UH. Oh, okay. You know, at first I went to the mainland because I just started surfing when I was like a junior in high school. Mm -hmm. And then um, by the time I graduated, I'd already applied for colleges like in Las Vegas, all these different colleges. 
And, you know, I was so excited to get back to the city and like to hip hop and all of that. So I was trying to pick like good places for that. But then I learned to surf. So I went to California for a semester. And then I was like, this is terrible. What am I doing here? The waves suck. It's cold. You know, what I mean? also, I was like, a di- I did diving. I was diving in high school. So I got a little bit of a help for diving. And it was I was outside in Long Beach. We were outside. It was freezing. I was like, oh, my gosh, you know. So I froze surfing and I froze diving, you know. So by by Christmas time, I was like, I got to come back to Hawaii, you know. So I came back to UH and um, and ironically, like my first contest was actually at Kalapana Drain Pipes, which is uh, the surf spot that got taken out by the lava. So my first contest was the last Drain Pipes contest, and now that spot isn't any. There's just there's nothing there but lava. And wow. that was called like Baby Sunset back then. That was like, um, like the premier surf spot on that side of the island. Yeah. And then in the last, the last one that happened a few years back, it took all of that. Like there were all these spots over there. So that's far from Kona. We would drive like three hours, but we'd go over there, you know, as together, you know, a whole bunch of us in a car, and um, yeah. So that's just crazy. Like the year I left, the spot where I first had my first contest. Is gone and now it's gone yeah i've heard about that um happening but i'm wondering are there new spots that are being developed you know they talked about that like after the the first time but now you know i i know this one this one girl who um oh, what's her name what's her name she she's from there she grew up there and she she was like Man, there was suddenly there was nowhere to surf. Yeah, it was all gone. Like our whole lives were disappeared, and so I just came to Oahu. <laughs> yeah, that's it's tragic. Crazy. Yeah, I mean, well, it is, and it's part of the it's part of the way everything works, though. You know, of course. Um, tell me about going to college. I mean, do, were did your parents insist that you go to college? Uh, what were you interested in studying, and what was your career path? Yeah, my parents were, um, yeah, it was pretty much like you go to college, that's what you do. <laughs> you know? Gotcha. Um, and so I was just doing that because of that. <laughs> yeah, fair <laughs> but, enough. You know, I, I went into fashion. I, my degree was in fashion merchandising. Okay. And I made my own company, us girls. So um, I, there was no women's surfwear at the time. There's only men's companies. The, I think, you know, Quicksilver, which wasn't Roxy yet, um, started making a little bit of women's clothes, but there were no like swimsuits that were functional or cute. It was like if you had to wear like a Speedo or something, there were no board shorts for women, um, nothing like that. Basically, the, the industry re- kind of rejected women. Like, you know, we shouldn't be out there. We're not marketable. We're there, there was just was nothing for us, right? <laughs> we had these contests, but they'd put us on like at the worst times of the day and stuff like that. And it was just, we were just kind of a joke or whatever. And so I was like, well, I'm going to make some women's surfwear, you know? So that's what I did. And then I actually, when I graduated from college, I went to um, Bali and had some samples made of my first board short. And then I came back and I, started this little clothing line and called us girls and um yeah roxy came out with the board shorts like a little bit after me maybe seven or eight months and then there's there's some other companies like right after me like lassen and um hapuna who had another girl surfer working with them and then like I think there was this line called Poot on the mainland. So I was like a sales rep through college. I was a sales rep for like surfwear and stuff. And I was also a a flower girl. Like I went to all the bars selling flowers. And yeah, I made more then than I do teaching, I think. (laughs) As a college (laughs) lecturer. (laughs) But but yeah, so I was doing that. And then um, I just made my own company and started selling it. But yeah, so was then, so was yours the first female board short? 
I, you know, I claim that it is, but um, Birdwell some, at some point said we made those shorts first, but they sort of just made them for a, like a team. They had like a team of girls or something and they seemingly they just made the shorts for that team. They didn't like sell them, you know. Okay. But yeah, I definitely think I was the first. Um, and and um, how were sales? I mean, now it seems like absolutely that's a huge category, but at the time, if there weren't a ton of female surfers, you know, what was that like? What, how were sales? And, uh, yeah, were you, well that, you know, that was the thing, like, that was what all the guys would say. Well, women are going to buy board shorts. They don't surf. I was like, yeah, but they'll buy them to wear the beach. Like they're cute, you know, like, yes, yeah. you know, and sure enough, they, they did like, they took okay. off. And I remember like talking to somebody, you know, on the North, when we were on the North shore and stuff and they're like, yeah, Roxy's coming out with some of those board shorts too. Cause I had, I had my shorts and they were like, but you know, that's just a gimmick. Like they're just going to do a few of those. That's never going to take off. And it did. Right. And then as soon as people saw there was money in it, that's when it really started to change for the women because of like, cha -ching, you know, um, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's really been a, I don't know, for me, it's just like a, the surf industry <laughs> is something that just, it, it's a wound that's just continually gets ripped open. You know, it's just like, it was, it was people like me, there was all these little, like small women owned companies. So I have, I have a, a photo of me, an ad. So it's an ad of me and my board shorts for this surf shop, which was the first women's surf shop called Water Girl. And that was in Encinitas. This lady, Ilona started that. And then there was the, uh, what was it, Water Girl? No, Water Girl Surf Shop and Wahini Magazine. So it was, that, and that was supposed to be the first women's magazine. So, um, you know, we all, we kind of like, the women just started making our own stuff. And we kind of started like nurturing and like this little women's industry. And we had all our like little teams. and stuff like that and then as soon as like the big companies who had like ne wanted nothing to do with us you know never really did anything for women surfing boom they were in they had all the money to just flood the stores with you know give them the the you know upfront deals and all of that and and then a lot of us just got wiped out yeah. So we couldn't we couldn't keep up you know yeah. and so you know it, it's a lot of them went down um mary hartman though girl in the curl she's still around she's got her little shop and her little there's a bunch of women's surf schools um isabel tiffany and you know so that was that was a time where you know women really like we kind of made this industry and none of us are ever no, noticed at all or recognized right. or talked about or written up or anything, you know? So. Ugh. Did, did um, Roxy or anybody at Quicksilver at the time reach out to you or did you have any connection with anybody about sponsorship or distributing your product or anything like that? I, well, I actually, I believe I wrote Roxy. For, I don't know if I wrote them to sponsor them I think I tried to get sponsored maybe I don't know but what I remember and I have pictures of I, I like keep keep I have such a collection of things um I remember they had this model right and the model looked just like Lisa Anderson right so they had Lisa Anderson and then they had their Roxy model who looked just like Lisa Anderson, but they couldn't use Lisa Anderson because they couldn't make that, you know, cross that boundary that you could be pretty and surf or that speed or that surfing was, was pretty, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you're athletic, you know, you're, and you know, back then it was like, if you were a surfer girl, you were a dyke, you know, and stuff like that. And it was just, ugh. You know, it's just, it's like I say, it's just, it's a, it's a wound that just, gets, yeah, it, it just bleeds, you know, and do you feel, 
like um, they're doing it any better, the industry, quote unquote, whatever remains of it. Do you feel like the industry is doing a better job supporting and promoting women's surfing now? I mean, of course, you know, like things are, I mean, women are, they're getting everything. Like they had the first women's pipe, pipe contest last year. It took them 52 years to do that though. Like, yeah. That was a lifetime, you know, that, that's that been my spot. And I always wanted to have that contest. You know, I never got that opportunity. And then, yeah. so, but why, you know, why are they doing it? I, I guess is my question. Is it just, I think, I think money's the ultimate motivator. Yeah all along the way you know it's um they whoever's in control of the accounting doesn't recognize that there is an emerging category Mm -hmm. and so they need somebody like you to come in start small service the community build the category and then they realize oh turns out there is they didn't want to risk their own money on it initially but once it's proven it's easy to swoop in and they have all their um, distribution channels already lined up, which you don't have. And it's easy for yeah. them just to take over. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how I feel like it is. It's like, I mean, yeah. I mean, the women are surf, you know, the surfing is amazing, you know, and it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's changed. It's, it's unbelievable, you know, but it's yeah. like that last year, literally it was like no girls hardly surf pipe. And then it's like a switch like there's money there's contests now everybody's out of pipe and it's just you know it's so driven that way you know yeah. and, and and then it, it's just for us it's kind of like so now there's all the hype about women at pipe you know and it's like i you know every every time it's like i watch pi- women at pipe pioneers at pipe and so they they left us out you know, they told us we weren't good enough or whatever it was. And, you know, then we start a little in our little industry. They took that. And now it's like, OK, all the women, it's all good now. You know, they're all a pipe. Here's the pipeline pioneers. And then now we're not in that either. Like none of us that like did any of that are ever mentioned as being a part of it. You know, I'm still there every single morning. Like I see every single one of those girls, you know, I've given my life to that wave. I sacrificed, I almost drowned out there many times. I was surfing out there as big as it gets. First thing in the morning with no lifeguards, with no money, no contest, no care. I just wanted to surf pipe, you know, and nobody ever mentions my name once. Yeah. Uh, never in any of the, I don't get a mention, you know, yeah. it's like, how do you like how do you like have a real industry when you're unwilling to look beyond the like who won a contest for the history of women surfing you know and so yeah it's like everybody's gonna have their little thing and then what um what was your first experience with pipeline do you remember the first time you saw it and certainly the first time you surfed it yeah yeah so the first time i surfed it so i was on the big island right and then i was i went and i was i was surfing over there on the mainland in california i met this girl linda who was part of the cal state long beach surf club so we were in the surf club so she came to visit me like in between the some break or something and um before i was i was going to go to uh the next year so i was still in the big island She's like, well, I'm going to take you to Oahu. Let's go to Oahu and go surf. And I was kind of like, yeah, I don't know. But I went with her and then she took us out to Ehukai. And so, um, and then I guess we got sucked over to pipe, <laughs> you know? And so a couple of the guys are like, hey, you guys know you're at pipe, right? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, so cool. So I was like, what's pipe? <laughs> what it was? I didn't wow. know the spots in Oahu at all. Like, I wasn't when- ever really... Yeah. But when you're at Aukai, were there sets rolling through at pipe? I don't I don't know. I I get it wasn't very it wasn't very big, but Okay. I can see that I probably would have ended up there cuz you know, I was used to reefs, so I would have I like the reefs. I don't like the sandbars still now, you know. So yeah, we ended up that's how I that was my first day at pipe and then I always kind of just 
was gravitated to to pipe because it's really actually similar to like banyans and some of those places on the big island because of the reefs and if you think about it like there's only really you know there's not that many lefts on the north shore I mean, yeah big lefts and stuff like so yeah I, I gravitated to it you know I went away from it for a, for a while and and then I eventually just ended up back there not too much longer so so uh obviously you got lulled into it on a day where it wasn't doing its proper thing once it is actually breaking it's incredibly intimidating and treacherous do you remember facing that fear the first time yeah so like you know like i say i mean it's it is that but it's like whatever you're used to right so like if you're used to like surfing banyans in like a foot deep of water with vana sticking out you know then that doesn't scare you as much as like oh i'm out at a sandbar and i keep getting pounded and i can't figure out how to get even get out of here and then i get out there and it's like all these clothes out right because i've never done yeah. that before right yeah. but i'm used to like taking off on steep drops and trying not to face plant my reef Gotcha. It's got a channel, you know. So you know, I'm just kind of doing what what came naturally to me, you know. And um, I don't know. I, I do have like the gymnastics background. I was pretty athletic, so I could make those drops, and you know, I could. I I was really strong and really fit and all that. So so um, yeah. And then also, you know, I was surfing because I I started out in in town. I moved to Honolulu because I was to be by school. So I surfed Ala Moana. That was my spot. So it's also similar to that. And all a lot of the guys that surf Ala Moana surfed pipe. Got so it. I sort of had that, you know, connection to go over there and start, you know, kind of trying. And when I got yeah. into it, you know, and I, I didn't surf it real big. You know, I actually, you know, there weren't very many girls on the North Shore. I mean, on the whole island, there's probably like, one or two handfuls of women surfers at that time you know yeah and women didn't surf you know i mean at that time the only the only girls surfing were um, bodyboarders out there but there were there were a bunch of those girls and those girls never get any recognition either like they were gnarly like they were charging pipe and they were going you know and and the crowd was really gnarly you know um, whether it was pipe or bowls, you know, you had to, you had to respect the lineup. You know, you didn't Who, just go out there and paddle yourself to the peak and go. What I like, year? I, I couldn't even look at the peak. I, I couldn't even look at some of the guys, you know, like, <laughs> like, and it wasn't just me. It was like anybody, like anybody who right. was young, even if you're Hawaiian, you had to, you had to like work your way up, you know, like. <laughs> so, so what? What year are we talking about where you were, was yeah. like your introduction there and who were the enforcers at the time? Yeah. So that first time would have been like 89 when I, okay. when I came and then I started really getting into it more like 93. And so like, you know, I paddled out, you know, the thing was back then, like got the guys, they didn't go out under six feet. That was like shame. Like they would say like, if it's under six feet, it's not, if that's not pipe, what are you doing out there? You know, I'm like, I'm going out there because you guys aren't out there. Right. But I actually kind of scored it, you know, when I was young, I just score it by myself a lot, you know, and um, it, it was kind of just me out there. And that's how I got comfortable was like just learning it small, you know, and then worked my way up to going big. And, um, you know, so when I remember like a couple of the times, I think when I started, that was kind of like the Jerry's like, it, you know, that's kind of when he, he was already on, on Maui or whatever. But I remember one session that was super crowded and all crazy. And it was like Jerry and Laird and, um, you know, like uh, Johnny Boy, you know, those guys. Um but yeah, it kind of came during that time. And on those small days, though, I remember when I started, it was uh, Christian, Christian Fletcher and Matt Archbold. They would be out on those small days, like busting their airs and stuff. 
And that's when yeah. who I really remember seeing. And they were like, they saw me, their eyes would get big. Like they were like, what do you, you know? I, I mean, you know, sometimes it was, it was mean. It was like, what are you doing out here? You know? And then other times it was like, they were really genuinely, genuinely scared to see a girl out there. Cause they thought I was going to die, you know? And maybe I yeah. was, you know, <laughs> like I said, I wasn't really that, you know, knowing that I was putting myself in, in a lot of danger a lot of times. And then I sort of found out the hard way. Well, in, in hindsight, were you ready for it? Were you competent? I don't think you're ever ready for it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think some, in some ways I did better in the beginning. And after, you know, you start getting so many poundings and the yeah. and all that, you start to get hesitant because you do start to realize like, oh my God, I don't want to end up like that again, you know? Yeah. And stuff like that. So you see other people die. You know, that's... have you? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah, I'm writing my dissertation is partly just like a oral history. It's sort of an account. Um, because I I wrote for this Honolulu Adver- Star Advertiser. Yeah. And I did a blog for Oceanic Cable, and I started tweeting like in 2008. So I I do this text to my friends. So. You know, the deal was like, I'd send like, I have like, I had like seven or eight friends in town. I'd send them the surf report for the North Shore. And then during the summertime, they would send me the report for for town, right? So it's when, when Twitter came to be, I, st- I was like, you know, I should just text this to Twitter. So I have like a record of these surf reports. So now I have a record of pipeline surf reports from 2008. Wow. Every day. So I took that, I made that into my dissertation and with my husband. So my husband, Sean Davies, photographer, and, you know, he's pretty, pretty well known. Um, yeah. So between his photos and my, my news articles and the tweets, we've composed like this, I call it a biography of Pipeline and Ala Moana Bowls because it's, it's about the wave, like the best days and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so. it's four, 14 years. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Um so I what your question was. No. <laughs> well, what I was going to ask you was I don't remember what I had asked you either but what I was going to ask you was um talking about the way your role in the hierarchy at pipeline. Yeah. I'm wondering if the resistance, do you feel like it was directed at you um, because you were a female and the only female in the lineup? Or do you think it was kind of a universal way that that hierarchy treats young people coming into the lineup? Yeah, you know, so I don't know, as as a female, like, at that time, I think many of us get, we get a real like complex, right? Like, because there is a lot of just bad stuff like you know but it, it's it's just there was bad stuff towards everybody you know but as a female it's just different bad stuff you know um and then as a howley you know you know you you're you're a different you're in a different place you know you're you're a howley you know so i thought it, it definitely went through some gnarly shit you know i'm not i'm not gonna lie like, but the end of the day like i what i found when i kind of became more friends with everybody is actually they were my friends all along you know they people were really watching out for me all along um but that everybody had to go through that. like all the guys had the hawaiian guys they they had to work their way up so like especially a bowl like especially in town like like you wouldn't even look at those guys outside you get you you get sent in, you know, you don't, like, you sit on the inside, like, you don't get to go outside, that was just how it was, that was, that was the rule, so you try to work your way up, you know, but as a girl, you know, it was different, I wasn't good, you know, I mean, I, I think I, I'm proud of what I was able to accomplish, you know, but, like, I had no help, like, I had no one to show me how to serve, I was just totally learning on my own, and trying to not get in the way, like, that was the thing, 
people back then you didn't you didn't have like all these people sitting on the inside like you do now right you get you get, you get beat up for that you know yeah. and i kind of and you know like people are like oh that was bad old days and stuff i i kind of wish we could go back to that in some ways because, there was more like, order there was order and it and the the privilege went to the people who were like putting their time in out there yeah you know so like i never really paddled to the peak at pipe you know um especially not in, i mean i not when all those guys were out but like they would call me or or a bulls it was more a matter of like they would call me over and tell me go right like so it's just and then like some of my guy friends are like the only waves i caught at pipe were the ones like they told me go like it wasn't like you could just it wasn't a free-for-all you know yeah um, but there was a like respect it was a respect that i learned that i never could have learned anywhere else you know it, it's a different type of respect that we learn you know in western culture we have a way of doing things and we have a way of thinking about sport and like and just life in general and then when you come into these lineups you learn this respect it's respect for the ocean the other people the people the people's ancestors you know that they they see their ancestors as being as part of the reef the sharks you know so you're coming into that environment and there's just this respect you know and once you gain that you're going to be a different person and to me that's that's more important than any wave could give me like mm. any amount of glory or any amount of like trophy or anything like that you know was learning how to like conduct myself in that environment it wasn't just me like i'm just going out there and i'm just talking to everybody and it was me like going out and being respectful to the the elders and learning how to like humble myself and, you know, yeah, um, that, I I love yeah. to hear you put it that way because I probably haven't ever put that into words myself, but that's a lot of why I got into surfing as well. Wow. Um, was those lessons that are inherent in the battle between man or woman versus nature? You just can't learn elsewhere, you know. And I've grown up in a suburban environment and so i'm not a hunter and gatherer and yeah. so i don't i don't learn those lessons right. in my day-to-day -day life but surfing is a place where that does exist there's a finite resource that we're all kind of battling for and and so i always valued that system and it blows my mind that nowadays people vilify it you know like so many people who are getting into surfing now are just like anti-localism which there's obviously an ugly side of localism as well but they're anti every version of it and they just think nobody owns the ocean this is a free-for-all you should be able to it's for everybody you know and it's like that sounds great however it also undermines so much of the value of that older system that you're talking about you know Right. And, and, you know, before it was all short boards, right? Like you went out to Piper, all Moana bowls. You, there were no longboarders. Right? Now you've got like all these people in longboards and they don't surf very well. And, but I can't really surf because of these people, because I'm going to get killed, you know? Yeah. But it's the free for everybody. And it's like, well, it's not free for the people that get hit by your longboard, you know. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, learning those systems, and I think, I think it's just it's important at some point, you know, I was able to like discern between like the surf industry and like the the guys that I grew up with, you know, um, who I went through things with, but ultimately, they they adopted me, you know. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, it, it's sort of an interesting dynamic there. You know, I mean, I, I consider the people at like at bowls and pipe, but I mean, pipe, it's just, it's been, it's kind of destroyed, you know, like with it, that group, there's no locals there anymore. I mean, not, not really. Um, we still have it at bowls. So I always reflect back to that, 
but um but yeah i mean that's that's my family you know yeah. my family went back to the mainland but those are those are my friends that i grew up since i was 17 years old 18 years old you know um, yeah that's that's it, family. I, mean, I see them every every year i see them every swell you know um yeah. did you uh feel like you ever earned the respect of those guys in the lineup and that crew in the lineup at pipe some of them you know definitely some of them um you'll never win you'll never win everybody over you know and there's yeah. definitely some people i pissed off you know whether it was because i got in their way or you know a lot of a lot of guys got pissed just because i was willing to go out there and they were standing on the beach and they just couldn't stand it you know so they'd say shitty things about me and and yeah the truth was i was just sitting out there and trying not to get mowed down <laughs> but i was still out there <laughs> you know yeah and yeah. i was out there like every swell i could possibly get out there i was out there you know so if anything i earned respect just for like my my de dedication you know like i don't yeah i don't think you'll find many more people that are more dedicated to pipe than i am even though i you know i never really got such a great wave or anything like that you know and like i don't really care i just i love that place like that's my home you know and even it, when it comes to a time where i can't surf there i'll probably still be there every morning just looking at the waves feeling the the mana you know looking at the shooting stars and the moon melting into the to, to the surf you know like i didn't have kids you know so like that's my home that's my baby you know so it's yeah you um you answered it just kind of briefly there but i was going to ask you if you've ever gotten uh the wave that you were looking for at pipeline after all these years yeah i you know my goal was always to catch the second reefer because like i figured out you know like i could go out on those smaller days like you know it, it some of the best days for me would be like the three to four foot days with the five or six foot sets because nobody would come out and if i could just sit out there for an hour and i could catch that five or six footer um you know that was back before the kids started coming <laughs> Um, and then after that, you know, the, the, after six feet, you know, the eight feet, the 10 feet that was right there on that first reef, like that was gnarly, you know? So, and the crowd, like, I just, I couldn't put myself in there. Cause I, I couldn't end up like getting caught and getting in the way. And I hurt my wrist at like 26. So I couldn't duck dive after that. Now I can barely duck dive at all. So I always had that problem where I really couldn't sit inside of people. And and like I said before, it, it just wasn't allowed. Yeah, I couldn't sit in there. So I figured out though, like if I just could, you know, muster up the courage to get out there on those twelve foot days, I was out there all by myself. Like I'm out there on that second reef. So I always surf the shoulder. You know, this. You know, people say it's the shoulder, but actually, you know, pipe has changed a lot. Pipe doesn't even break the way it used to. But there used to be the main peak and then the second peak. Mm -hmm. and that's where I would catch the waves most of the time is from that second peak and and that's not like the sandbar that's the reef and then it goes into the sandbar you know right. but then when it gets 12 feet there's like there's a, another two peaks out there and so I would try to ride that even I could even go to the peak of the second reef because it would usually just be me and two or three other people out there and I just had to go and like be patient and stuff. And man, I got so close to catching one of those once. I mean, literally, like I, I was starting to go down, but I just didn't quite get it, you know. And then after, I remember that day, I was just like, oh man, I know another one's gonna come. So I just waited, and it, literally the swell just stopped. And I was like, darn it! And that was like the closest I ever got. But that was that was my dream to like catch the second reefer and ride it through all the way through the barrel, you know. And that, and I'll admit, you know, every that's part of why I show up every morning because if there's ever a, another perfect day, <laughs> I know I could still maybe catch it. I, my my problem is my my leg might give out because I have a really bad hip and a bad knee. 
So I'd hate to like stand up and be all in the barrel and then just have my leg give out, you know what I mean? But, but you yeah. know, so yeah, that was always my dream was, was that. But even though I never caught it, you know, it was so worth it just to get me out there and all those crazy swells and just to be out there in that size, you know, is so magnificent. It's just, that's unbelievable. It's like, I don't know, like it's, it's not even of this world. Yeah. What like what are among the worst experiences that you've had out there? Yeah, well, you know, like I say, it, it's it's not all the guys, and and it's but you know I, when I started, like like I said, there, you know there there were some girls later on that like Rochelle, they came Rochelle and Keala, um, but you know back then the pros, whether it was guys or girls, they they really weren't fr- focused on big waves. So they they weren't really going out big or anything like that, you know, I mean, not real big and stuff. Um, but you know, I was going out there and I, I would just get I would get harassed. Like if they saw me walking down the beach and it was it was I mean it's huge, you know, it's it's white watering. Like, what are you doing, Lane? And that was my all the way down to the beach. What are you doing, Lane? Don't go out, Lane. What are you doing, Lane? What are you doing, Lane? You know, and it's like try going out to pipe with that. I mean. Yeah, Moana Jones is like, I, she's unbelievable. I can't even like believe, I can't believe my eyes. But when she walks down the beach, everyone is cheering for her. She has thousands of followers. She has $80,000 prize purse. She had a pipe contest since she was a kid. She has people who are like, you know, just it's all going on for her. So for me, it was just like all of this, like, you know, I'm going to die thing, you know, and so that's when I started going really early because I was like I got to get out there before those guys show up so I just started and that's what I did I'd get out there the crack of dawn and then I'm out there they can't say anything to me I'm just (laughs) out there but then they're pissed because they're like no I gotta go out there because she's freaking out there and then they started calling me the buoy because I sit so far on the shoulder you know I'm like that's all right everybody's gotta gotta go around the buoy and sometimes yeah. he catches the biggest wave, you know, <laughs> but yeah, it was just constant. And then, you know, this one time it was like my worst wipe, wipe out ever. Um, so I, I was really careful, you know, and, and they always wanted to tell me I shouldn't be out there. So I knew I better not fuck up. You know what I mean? So it was like 10 and I know it was like 10 years because, and this is, uh, I think it was in 2007. I'm going out and there's nobody out, right? And the whole morning was like kind of washing through and stuff. And it was kind of north. So if it's like, if it's west, it'll hold up to almost like 20 feet. I think there was like one, a couple swells last year like that. I mean, like it'll be like Waimea size pipe. But if it's north, it won't hold over much over 12 feet. And and usually actually kind of close it out like eight or 10 feet, depending on how north it is and the sand and all that. So this day it was kind of, it was west, but it had that north, you know, but I was just like, at one point I was just, I was on this, like, I didn't care. I was going out. Like I, that's the way I did. I'm going out. If it, if it lets me out, it, it, that's, that's still the way I do it. But you know, it used to be like 15 to 18 feet. Now it's like five feet and I don't get out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so um, I was just like, so, cause you got the sandbar and you got pipe, you know, and be and the problem is too like pipe has kind of become more of a sandbar whereas before it would just be this reef and then the sandbar you know yeah that's like 10 feet waves over there but it's a clear reef and it was like really long period swells really clean now we get like close together swells a lot of swells at one time not very many west swells the sand never moves the erosion is like seemingly just taking the beach so the the sand never moves out of the channel and that's where I used to surf right next to that channel so I kind of run to the channel and then run to the wave run to the channel and now the channel is like a humongous whirlpool but this day so this day was kind of like north and I and then there's nobody there's like two or three guys out I'm like screw it I'm going I'm just going fuck it so I run down there and I the mistake I made too is I followed like Cole Cole Christensen, so he had he had he used to go in the morning. He goes more in the afternoon now, but 
he had a little group of guys. So I was like, well, I'm just, I was scared. You know, there's no one really out. So it's like, I'm just going to follow them. And that was a bad move. Cause those guys, you know, that's one thing I learned as a girl, like you're, you can't keep up with the guys, like, you know, all this women's lib and all that, but you know, when it comes down to it and you're 115 pounds uh, on a much smaller board, you <laughs> get pushed back. Right. So anyways, I pat the way I did it was I tried to make it through that little keyhole you know I never let it suck me down to the lifeguard stand because I'm by myself I always surf alone and so I always figure people can see me so as long as I took make it through the keyhole you know even if I don't then I'm gonna get washed in by a cut so um there I am I'm going I'm going right and this huge set comes at like a hukai and hits me so hard that my later on my doctor told me he thought I got a concussion I was wearing my helmet just from the how hard it hit me wow um, it was a, it was a closeout it washed me I think I got held under two waves and so I'm like oh my gosh is this it you know so I I like I like get washed in and the current is so strong like you know like you're you're literally like 10 12 feet from the shore but you're thinking like I'm not gonna make it because it's just going so fast I'm like trying so hard and I'm like five feet from the shore and somehow I I get in but my legs are totally cramping up like I'm so out of oxygen that I'm crawling up the beach wow and one of the lifeguards because I usually surf before the lifeguards but we we had waited a little bit that day because it wasn't that good and so the lifeguard's like yeah, well, you're lucky you got hit by that one instead of the 20 footer behind it. You're okay. You just got your ego bruised a little bit. And I'm just like, <sighs> I was like, 10 years. They've been waiting to tell me I shouldn't freaking be out there. And they right. finally got to say it. But I lasted 10 years before <laughs> I had a really bad wipeout like that, you know? And then, like, wow, it was just so like, he didn't even ask if I was okay. He told me I was okay. Yeah. You know, on the other side of that, though, I had people like Dave Wassel, who was like really cool. Like, I remember one day, it was one of those days I was walking up, down, and up and down the beach. Like, should I go? And he's like, You're going to go out, Lane? I'm like, I think so. And he's like, Well, you know what, Lane? I trust your, ju your judgment because I know I see you go out there and you, you just do what you can do, you know? And it, so it's like, it's just that there's 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 the guys that support you. There's the guys who don't, you know. Yeah. And you can't get tied up in like everybody hates me. You gotta be like, no. There's a lot of there's a lot of people that did. It took a, a long time, but they saw my dedication and all that, and they took me in and they watched out for me and they helped me and stuff like that. Well, it sounds like. Um you've always done what you were going to do regardless of what they were telling you as you're walking down <laughs> yeah. to the beach but i wonder if if that um if it did erode your self esteem or if it did have negative effects on your psyche um even though you still did what you wanted to do was there a lasting effect of that negativity i'm sure there is you know i i think it's it's worse now it's worse now because it's like the way I just, it's not even like people aren't, aren't acknowledging me. It's like, I feel like they're intentionally trying to erase me out of the pipeline picture. And I can't be like before, whereas before it was like, well, I don't care what anybody thinks. I just want to be at pipeline. You know, I'm just going to keep going out. Like that was it. And now I can't even just go like, oh, well, screw them all. I'm out there, you know? Yeah. So it's like, it's, it is really hard because it, you know, it's like, I feel like, I mean, I put myself in this position, right? I mean, I, everything I did was like probably the most male dominated thing you could do, <laughs> you know, but like the hip hop community recognizes me, you know, it's, you know, they find people to vouch for me. They recognize me to some extent, you know? Um, and like I said, the surfing, the local surf, surfing community, they love me. They, you know, they're my family. But the surf industry, it, it it is hard. It's like you feel like, God, am I am I that am I really that terrible of a surfer that <laughs> that I surfed pipe for 30 years every day and I went out bigger than any of these girls and 
I gave everything to it. I, I didn't have kids. I didn't do anything. I made the first one. And I guess I'm just so awful that no one wants to recognize me. You know what I mean? Like now it's just, it's harder because it's just, I, it's, I've given my whole life to this, you know? And it's like, not, nope. and I never did it for the recognizing, you know, like any recognition yeah. of that, but it's hard to be so like, you know, just, I don't know, it's hurtful. And and a lot of times it's the females. It's the females that do it. And that's what makes it more hurtful. But they're just sort of following the what the guys are saying. So it's sort of like those same guys in the industry who like always put us down, da, 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 da. They're happy to welcome the new women, right? Because they're good. They're living up to the standard and they're making money off of them and they're blah, blah, blah. But they're they've never lamented. They've never like, acknowledge that the only reason those girls are doing what they're doing is because we did what we did you know and and so it's like it's just it's the same thing it's like when they were young when we were young when we did all that they told us we were weren't worthy and now they're still just telling us we're not worthy the yeah. only reason the women now are doing good is because they're worthy and we're not and it's just i don't know how does how can that not affect you? You know, yeah. like, and and now I'm like sitting here, two master's degrees, PhD, writing about surfing. And I can't, I, I did a lot of journalism for surfing. I did a lot of freelance writing. You know, I wrote a article about pipeline last year. It was going to get published and it was ready to go to press. And it's not just me, you know, I mean, another woman that they never mentioned is Alex Florence. Like, look at all the males whose dads, you know, Mason Ho, you know, um, how many of Liam, you know, Alex, Alex Florence started, you know, she started going out to pipe. It was after me sometime, but she was, that was like when longboarding started. So you had like Dino and Bonga and, and Dino was at like there every morning with me. He was like a pipe guy. And um, she was like out there in a longboard and that was like nuts. And she went out like 10, 12 feet crazy and she's getting barreled out there you know and she's not like a super high performance surfer or anything but she came to the north shore when there were no surf and she was a short bird at first but you don't hear people going like wow you know john john and nathan and ivan the reason they're such great pipe surfers is because their mom is a pioneer and she yeah. surfed pipeline and that's like that's what i'm saying about they're not doing it for the women like it's all about this standard that and this marketing thing. And it's just like, they're leaving out what's important. And then the other one you have is Emilia. So Tamayo's wife, she was a bodyboarder. So she was one of those bodyboard chicks that were nuts. And then when Blue Crush came, which is like, I guess in like 2002, you had all these girls starting to come out to pipe and she was bodyboarding. She's like, well, and they weren't very good surfers. They were like, you know, model girls who want to get attention so she's like okay well i'll get a surfboard and so her and robin cardoza would just like get surfboards and go surf pipe and they would just eat shit you know but <laughs> after that she eventually she kind of liked it so she started surfing and next thing you know she was out there big you know and just like but then and so and that started with blue, blue crush so you i remember in the magazines they're like where are there any girls surfing pipe they're like yeah there's these kind of underground girls but you know, no pros. And that's exactly what they said last year during the Pipe Masters. Yeah, there's these kind of underground girls, but there weren't really pros, just Megan and Rochelle. I mean, just Rochelle and Kel. And it's like, well, shouldn't that mean like we get more attention? Yeah. Like we were willing to do it before the pros. We weren't as good as the pros, but we're water women, you know? We were yeah. surfing big waves, you know? And it's like Ace Cool wasn't like a high performance surfer. But he surfed big waves and he got, you know what I mean? So it's just like, and then he had like a bunch of Brazilian girls like Mika, Mikaela and Sylvia, who now they're like nominated for Red Bull. They were surfing pipe, you know. Um, then you have like a few other people that are notable. And then like before me, you had all these girls charging sunset and there was like, like I said, there, so there was a time when women surfing, like I think in the 70s, it was kind of hip, right? And I think that's probably because it was about style, you know, and stuff. And you had all those 
those girls and on um, like Margot time and and it seemed like it was better then but in the 80s you just had this like I guess when it became real radical it was just like this anti thing yeah you know so we we did all that we stuck in there we put up with all of that we made the industry we surfed huge waves with no nothing and now we're still just treated by the industry like those chicks that aren't worthy <laughs> yeah what do you what do you think re- what do you think recognition would look like to you it's as simple as just including us you know i, I mean simply hearing people mention my name you know what i mean they'll ask they'll be like they'll i i love moana i mean don't get me wrong i think she's so amazing and i i she's literally doing an interview with nathan florence she's like i never had any older girls out there when i started surfing i mean i'm like oh you're saying this to (laughs) nathan whose mom was out there every day you know and me amelia and alex are still out there we we have more longevity than probably all but maybe five other people at pipe you know (laughs) and it's like that's a there's a lot to be said you know for still trying to go out at pipe 52 I mean, whoever you are you know totally but is there's just there's just it's it's like it's like they can't recognize us because it's recognizing that they were wrong you know oh yeah that's what i feel like you know that's a great that's a great way to put it yeah and it's like you never you don't hear it you don't hear about how those companies refuse to make women's clothing and they refuse to sponsor women and you know it's but it was simply what it is yeah i mean it's well documented i did a lot of documenting but but those there was so many women's magazines for a while and those are all gone you know yeah so yeah it's it's so much better but it's it's worse and then there's so much infighting between the women and it's just oh gosh yeah i i (laughs) I asked you earlier, like, if you feel like it's gotten better and that was actually a dumb question because of course it's gotten better, (laughs) but really what the, the heart of the question was more, uh, is it where it should be? You know what I mean? Like, I, I still feel like it's, um, represented entirely differently. And it's also, there's a bunch of built-in limitations in the way that they structure the events or the scheduling and all that sort of stuff that, um, it's still treated like a novelty side sport, you know, sideshow right. from the contest point of view. Yeah. And I think that's probably the, the biggest problem really is like, if we look at the contest themselves, right. I mean, what is that? How, what are those standards? How are those standards set? Like what determines what makes someone the best surfer? You know, well, it's a it's a male. It's a standard that was set for the male surfing abilities. Right. So, so it's not based yeah. off of like Hawaiian waves because if right. you read like all the old Hawaiian stories, um, the best surfers, one some which were females, were the ones who could ride all the way to the beach without being wet, and that meant they were the one who knew how to catch the best wave that could take them all the way to the beach. And if you look at now, how are they doing the contest? they're jet skiing the, the, the people out to the lineup so like if you're gonna have a women's pipe contest in 10 foot surf and you got someone like moana who knows the spot and you got three other people who don't and they they're not gonna and they don't get jet skied out there that gives moana a lot more of an advantage because those those folks just might not even get out totally you know what i mean that's really imp- like that's a really important part of surfing is knowing the ocean. That's a if you're surfing pipe, that's the most important part. But when you just start jet skiing people out there, you know, and and then you know they've all got their escorts, and so for me that's just like, wow, you guys you guys rip, and then you just pay people to take you out and get you your waves. So all those years that I sat and waited my turn, they don't have to do that. They just pay pay the people that are out there to go and get on their waves and i mean it's well, like good i'm glad so, they're getting waves but that's let me ask not, you this 
those escort those escorts that you're talking about are always locals who are respected within the community so yeah. is there is there any animosity towards those locals do they do you or the community hold that against them yeah well last last year was gnarly you know because well they switched the contest so they this year this year they took the local contest so the contest they're having with the vans is supposed to be the one that all the locals i mean i think right this is the local qualifier so now it's an invite oh so okay. now, now the locals this so this is the contest that the locals did and two people get to go into the pipe masters so now it's not just anybody can enter it's whoever they want to invite got it you know so now the locals have no way of getting into the, the premier contest so this contest is a is a wash then you have the backdoor shootout, which is really local, but it's also an invite um, for the women's. I think the women's, which was the first time they had last year, that's a WSL, I think heat. I think WSL page for that. And then the third one is the the tour one. So now all these contests are taking. I mean, pipe doesn't. Pipe used to break a lot more early season, but now it doesn't. Like. So you have such a short pipe season and now like it's all, almost all taken by contests that are either in, invites or sanctions. So people, people get pissed, you know? Um, yeah. And, you know, that was happening last year. One of my friends has a, a young surfer and she was just so mad that this person was coaching because their son's just trying to go out there and surf. And how can he compete when, all the other surfers have coaches with them you know um but i just told her so we can't be mad at each other because those guys that are being paid are like they're just trying to survive right so it's all a matter of like the surf industry like just you know some of it's female but some of it's just the way it works you know it's like they just discard people and they're just trying to make money like they're just trying to survive and pay their family yeah. so i just try to rem remind myself of that you know and and it is it is good that not just it's great that those girls have people helping them and and actually watching them like i was doing that no one was watching me and it, there's a very different way of surfing when you surf alone and there's no lifeguards you know yeah. um but it's just it's destroyed our community like we don't go out and surf with our friends anymore we go out yeah. and surf with a bunch of people who are training for a contest you know, so they say, oh, well, just don't surf pipe. It's like, well, sorry, but this is a nice spot. I've been surfing here for 30 years, you know, but it, oh, just go surf somewhere else, you know. And it, so, yeah, it, it's a lot of animosity and the surf industry is just, it, it, it chooses who they want, you know. If it totally not, does. If you're not the chosen one, then. Yeah, it's. um the more you talk about it, the more I realize that wave specifically has just become so commodified yeah. that it really comes down to dollars and cents. And it makes sense that the girls, the international girls are showing up that they would employ the local former pro or whoever it is to be that escort. And it's great to kind of put that money back into the community. And some of those former pros, maybe they never felt like they got their due for their pioneering of whatever it was yeah. that they did. And so this is a great opportunity for them to kind of benefit from that. But it then commodifies it, you know, it then becomes about dollars and cents rather than about surfing, obviously. Right. So it's just it's hard when the, it's when some of those girls start going, oh Lane, she just only surfed on the shoulder. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, yeah, I was never not going to surf on the shoulder. Um but you know, don't have to be yeah you don't have to take a dig <laughs> so it's just there's no you know but there's no like caring about the the community that's there there's no caring about the history that came before you it's just i gotta get my wave i gotta get my reel i gotta get my trophy and then i'm out of there you know yeah. and then they leave and all we have left is potholes and freaking then we spend the rest so we spend the surf season, say waiting in traffic for contests that come or don't come. And then that ends. And then we spend the rest of the time with them fixing the roads. For... 
so it's just like the North Shore has just been dumped upon. Most a lot of people have left. the The, the rental price for housing is insane. So totally. most of the people I grew up with aren't on the North Shore per se. So you know, before wherever you went around here, it was like you went to food land. You saw everybody you know. You went or ever you surfed, you, you just saw your friend. But now it's just like you, if you kind of like you're walking around and you just don't see anybody, and then you see somebody, you get so excited, like oh, somebody I know. <laughs> and then the, it's it's like the foreigners that are like talking to everybody because there's so many of them. You know, and then they treat you like you you don't belong at your own spot you know it's just yeah so we talk about psyche you know that kind of stuff gets me the most I think just like I just you know I just want to surf and, and be with my friends and 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 have some kind of you know I work I, I work really hard I, I teach in five I taught five classes you know and it's like I have that little bit of time to surf or be at the beach and, you know, I have this little bit of time off now and it's got all this contest. So it's like, I go to the beach in the morning. I don't know if they're going to have the contest or not. So not only can I, you know, only surf pipe for a little while or, and then that's going to be super crowded. And then, but even if I don't, it's like, okay, where can I surf that the, not going to be traffic that I don't have to sit for two hours and then, by the way, I can't go to Foodland. And by the way, how am I going to get to work? Okay, I got to go that way to work. You know, imagine yeah. that. you're just like, no. I got to go to work. And they decided to suddenly have the contest today. So now I got to, it's going to take two extra hours for me to get to work. You yeah. know what I mean? It's really gnarly for our community. Well, it's taken away so much of the reason for being there in the first place. Right, right. Um, let's talk about your work a little bit though. Um, you introduced surfing literature as a course. Yeah. Tell me about, tell me about why you got into teaching your passion for teaching and lecturing and what you're doing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I've gone on such a tangent. You know, I think that started partly with uh, surfing and all of that, that I experienced, you know, I was like a, I was like a, I'm a still a really spiritual person, but I was a pretty conservative Christian growing up. So I started really having issues as the, the church became more political and their views about women and what they were teaching from the pulpit. And I really started to have this like clashing and, and I really started to see where like the underlying structures of the like race and gender were in the church. So I went back to school to study religion. So okay. I have two master's degrees in religion, but um, you know, they didn't have a, a graduate pro program for religion. So I went into English um, as, you know, like a biblical literature scholar. And I ended up right back with surfing. You know, <laughs> but I'm teaching English, which is really labor intensive because you it's like, yeah, I have to grade, I have to grade like 90 papers every two weeks wow I really what I want to teach like I wanted to teach religion you teach English the for entry level English course you're teaching like the course nobody wants to take right? right and all you do is editing so I loved being a journalist but I didn't like editing so now I'm just like this editor of oh gosh but you know so I introduced these creative writing classes so one is um uh Nalu, a new wave of creative writing so we do look at surfing as like a form of creative writing and reading. And I, I really, what I really do is like to bring, and I do the same thing with hip hop, but what I really do is to bring it into the classroom. I talk about like using the media and I talk about like, look at the advances surfing has made in like photography, right? Like from the fish islands, you know, we've got the drones, we got so many different lenses and you know all this multimedia like videos and I mean surfing and hip-hop and remix culture has just really brought us a whole new form of literature you know it's it allows us to bring all these you can call them sports but you know I prefer not to call surfing a sport um, it's a for me it's a cultural 
practice, you know, it, it was really important in Hawaii history. If you read the Mo'olelo, it, it was part of their religion. It was part of their, their way of getting knowledge and even maybe like accumulating land, the kings and stuff like that. So, you know, I see it as a, as a cultural form. And so when we surf or when we watch surfing, we're actually learning about Hawaii history and Hawaii culture and forms of knowledge. So I bring that in, but then I also say, you know, uh, you know, we can, we can look at, instead of having, writing my biog biography, you know, um, I can show, I can make pictures of my waves, right? So I, I, I use like Anthony Walsh and I say, you know, this is his autobiography, right? He's got all these different angles of him surfing this tube at pipe. And then I'll ask the students, like, watch the video and then write about what it's like to be in the tube. And you know what? A lot of them can hmm. because they can hear it. They can see it. And if they can, you know, they get that experience. now. Like, think about what we've given to people you know, through this culture of surfing or sport to like, as far as literature goes, I mean, even like contests and like the commentary or just, you know, like my surf report, I, I say that's like, you know, wow, that's 30 years of like looking at a wave every day, you know? So you have the science, like I'll, I could, I can go get all the, you know, national weather forecasts and all their readings. But what my reports are is like a breakdown of what it really looks like with those readings, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that's that's what I'm doing with with those types of things. Fascinating. I don't know where it's really gonna lead. <laughs> again, you know, I'm finding myself like with all these scholars. And you know, I, I was watching the movie Elf last night, you know, the Christmas movie. And uh, you know. I don't know if you've seen that, but of course, Elf yeah. is like this big doofy guy, and like everybody's like, oh, he he wears this big doofy suit, and he's always excited, and you know, I see myself. That's how I I think the academic see me is just like I'm always excited, I'm always smiling, I'm talking about surfing, you know, I have my surfboards in the back, and they're, but they totally don't think they don't take me seriously. So it, it's going back to that stereotype of like if you surf, you couldn't possibly be serious. This couldn't possibly be a serious dissertation. Talk about surfing. I mean, what does that contribute to the world? You know, but um, I think it contributes a lot. You know, but it doesn't really matter. I think the people in the power positions have to care. You know, no matter which you, way you look at it. Do you have any interest in writing a book? Well, you know, I hope. I hope my dissertation will. It's five hundred pages. <laughs> It'll probably turn into a few books if people, you know um find it interesting or relevant you know or i just i was thinking about um william william finnegan who wrote barbarian yeah. days yeah he talked he talked about that not feeling um like he was taken seriously by the literary world and he lived in new york probably yeah. i mean he still he still probably does you know so he's He's in a circle that has no awareness of the surf world at all. But he always talked about concealing his surf identity right. because yeah. he knew that he wouldn't be taken seriously in that world. But ultimately, he was able to utilize those skill sets to write a biography, an autobiography that obviously yeah. has made big waves. Yeah, I actually I wrote about that in my dissertation. But my way of looking at it is I'm comparing it to Jerry Lopez's book. Um, Surf is where you surf is where you find it. So I sh I show a comparison between like you know Jerry I don't believe he's Hawaiian but more of a uh, he's you know he's a yogi so more of an Eastern way of maybe looking at things and more of a Western so the very name of a barbarian you know compared to like um, Jerry who sees surf as like you know enlightenment really. So I use that to sort of show this like different way of looking at the world reflected by how we see surfing. And if you go back and you look at the missionaries and how they perceive surfing, it's the same, right? It's it's different, but it's the same, right? Like so that was like pagan, it was entertainment. It immediately gets taken as entertainment instead of culture. Um 
And yeah, I, I just, that's really the point is that we have to bring into education things that aren't written word and talk. I mean, we can bring dance, we can bring surfing, we can read it like literature. And that's how you start like decolonization, not by just adding more books, right? Yeah. But yeah, well, barbarian days, it's really, um, it really shows them. Um, yeah, it along, shows that, uh, that sort of like um, coming of age view of surfing. Yeah, it's something you do when you're young, and then when you get old, you have to become like this. When you, when you become old, you have to become a, a valued citizen, and surfing isn't being valuable. That's just like he actually he actually says it. It's like going out and worshiping nature or something like that which is really what the hawaiians yeah do right totally so so yeah it's it keeps coming back it, it's it's there in the in our surfing contest it's been in our literature you know our the western view of surfing and the hawaiian view of surfing or the eastern view maybe is so is just totally different and i think that comes back to what we were saying about like the lineups is like when you surf if you surf in in that old way that we used to, you're you're learning something that's really important that can change the way you you're, you're, you can change as a person. Yeah, it changes the way you um, see the world. You know, can, Shh, can you can you tell can me you? this? might actually relate to what you're talking about but can you tell me what intelligent movement is yeah so that's that's intelligent movement well intelligent movement comes from krs1 that's some of his lyrics so he says um hip is to know it's a form of intelligence hop is a form of movement um so hip is to it's your to be hip to your hop is to be aware of how you move so that's how he explains hip hop and so I use that and I talk about that as surfing and hip hop because hip hop, you know, back in those days, it was, um, you know, it was, it was on the streets. So you had to like battle your opponent of an opponent that you didn't even know. So, you know, whatever skills they did, you would have to pull out your skills in, in response to that. You had to go to the music. It was all about the music. You know, and then surfing is the same thing, right? Like we go out there, we can know, we we know as much as we can, but we have to respond to what the waves are giving us, right? We have to be hip to our hop. We have to be aware of how we move or why we're moving. And so that's what it is. It's intelligent movement. It's it's um learning through improv, you know, learning through applied knowledge, not practiced always choreograph, you know, looking at different forms, these different forms of culture or art as a reflection of a new way of, of like living or being, yeah. Um, as you're talking, I, surfing is in a, I think in a very strange spot currently, yeah. um, the way that it's represented on the competitive level through the WSL, the way that it's represented through social media and vlogs and all of that, I think it's in a bizarre place. But hearing you talk today reminds me surfing has come, has a long tradition of amazingness and coming from a very unique and pure place. And I think that it has, I think it'll have that role in the future as well. And, um, and you've done a beautiful job articulating a lot of that stuff. And I think you've played a very important role in all of it along the way so i'm glad to be able to share this conversation with everybody yeah thanks yeah i mean that's what it is you just i, I just keep going every day and keep doing what you know i love and good trying to live right you know totally um final question for everybody is just what was the last surfboard you rode and whose boards are you riding at pipe all these years? Oh gosh. Yeah. So, um, I rode Ipa 
Ben Ipe was making me boards when I was on the tour. And he he kind of coached me a little bit. Um, and then Chuck Andrus. And I still have a couple Andrus boards. They're a little thick for me, though. But um, And then for for the most part, Tokoro. So he, he makes my boards. And um, he's like a crazy underground pipe charger. Yeah. I remember, you know, when we were surfing a lot in like the 2000s, you know, 2000, late 2000s, I was thinking we'd go out before the contest and I'd be like, Wade entered this contest. He would beat all these guys. Like he really, yeah. His peak was like the Wakita peak. It was like sort of a little bit inside of that. Oh, yeah. What an amazing surfer. You know, I surf with him and this guy Rick, and it would be like us all the time. Um, but yeah, so he he's amazing, and um, so he makes me really good boards. And my last, the last board I rode this morning, I don't remember. I have like I, lately the surf reports are so messed up that I have like four or five boards in my car. I I don't know what I'm gonna do or where I'm gonna go. Or, I probably it was probably a five ten. Of coral. Yeah. <laughs> um what uh obviously you're surfing every day. We were talking earlier about kind of your body's limitations, but what are you doing to um outside of the water to maintain the ability to surf, diet, exercise, all that sort of stuff? It's so hard, you know. I, I try so many things. <laughs> When I hurt my shoulder, I was like, man, I'm going to rehab this and stuff. And I went to all this rehab and it got so much worse. Really? <laughs> and I realized, I was like, I was like, you know what, Lane, they're trying to get your shoulder back to normal. And people were like, you might need surgery kind of thing. And I was like, your shoulder ain't going back to normal. So like, just don't piss it off. Right. Like, I guess if I want, I mean, I, I guess if I want to go get surgery on everything, then. I could just like go get surgery on my whole body. But in six months, if I didn't surf every day, I don't know if I'd be able to surf. So I don't know. It's it's really hard. Like I do, I try because I I really want to be out there big at pipe. I really want to catch a big bowl or a big pipe. But you know, you, you try to you try to build yourself up and you end up hurting yourself just doing yeah. that. And then you get so mad. You try to eat right, but then so much of that is like trends too. You know, and it's like sometimes I try to eat all that plant-based food and stuff, and it's like I have allergies, so I think I'm allergic to some of the plants. Other times, like you know, oh man, you know. So it's just like I don't know. You just have to you have to follow like our instincts, just like we do in the surf. You know, you yeah. you, you try to do the best you can, but you got to just listen to your body. Yeah. Some people like, I mean, look at Kelly Slater. He's still like. I'm doing unreal. Totally. Um, but we're not all Kelly Slater. And um, that's not all we do. We all have to yeah. work. Yeah. Uh, we just that's have, a like huge you part said, of it. We, we, do, we do what we can, you know. And, you know, I might not be able to go out on like a one to two foot day that's on shore, but I might be able, be able to paddle on a 12 foot day because it's perfect and I know the reef. So I just have to like know what I know and do what I yeah. do. And that's that's what saved me at Pipe out all those years. You know, all those people were telling me what I could and couldn't do. And I knew what I could and couldn't do. And I didn't I didn't do stuff to get famous or to get money or to get anything. I just did what I could do. And ultimately, the people who do respect me, that's why they respected me. Because yeah. I wasn't shamed to, like, not go or to paddle in or to get washed down or, you know, I just followed my heart. Yeah. That's what I do. <laughs> awesome all right all right well thanks so much lane aloha okay bye